I was uh, working in the business uh, as a young writer story editor. And I was, uh, I was at NBC Matinee Theater and uh, suddenly NBC announced that they would want a, uh, a loyalty oath, a loyalty oath signed by each employee. In those days, the networks hired all the talent and paid all the talent. And I remember hearing that, and I'd been in the Air Force for three years, I'd been in combat, and I read that and I, and I was very uncomfortable with it. I said, look, I'm, I'm loyal to my country, I love my country, but to sign a loyalty oath, it has an uncomfortable feeling like kind of some kind of dictatorial government. And we were in a rehearsal hall, NBC Matinee Theater, and um, uh, one or two other people had started talking about it. The next day I got a phone call, and the phone call was from a very nice man, an NBC West Coast executive named Frank Cleaver. And Frank called me and said, I understand that you are not going to sign the loyalty oath. I said, I'm very uncomfortable with it. I really don't want to sign it. He said, listen, let me sign, set, set you straight. Let me set you straight. You are not a big name in this industry. You are not prominent in this industry. You're not, star, you're not a star. He said, if you don't sign a loyalty oath, NBC can fire you and you will be unemployable anywhere in this town. You're not big enough to sustain this kind of a situation. I thought about it and the next day I signed it. I found out that everybody else signed it. Uh, that was the first time that I realized that there was this, this cloud over Hollywood that was a, a dark cloud over Hollywood. We were, we were in, a, in a time of palpable fear that you could feel. Then when I was, um, I was at CBS later, um, I can remember, I was story editing, I can remember receiving a memo from business affairs office. I received a lot of memos. And this one, memo was headed, the following writers are not available. And then there was a list of names um, of 10 or 12 writers whose names I knew. And then opposite their name was a simple sentence, uh, a reason. Uh, not available until September 9th, uh, working at MGM or whatever. Then the next name, um, not available this year, uh, writing a play. A play has been optioned. One of his plays has been optioned and so on. And each name had an explanation. Well, it looked to me as a story editor like this was a perfectly legitimate statement of where certain prominent writers were. That's what I needed to know. About the second time I got that, I realized, wait a minute, this is a list. This is a list of people who may or may not be available, but I'm not to contact them. The whole subject of blacklist was accomplished by usually private organizations like Red Channels, Red Alert, and so on, which were formed mostly by former FBI men who had found the names in publications, uh, probably left-wing publications, and it simply listed names. This person has some kind of a left-wing orientation, so this person should not be hired. Networks used those as a basis of their own attitudes and so on. Ad agencies had their own list of names. Uh, so it was not a blacklist, it was many lists. And sometimes people could work at one network but were unemployable at another uh, because the lists were confused and confusing. Uh, so it was, it was a, a, a time of terrible fear. The networks fully cooperated because the ad agencies were saying, in effect, we don't want any of those commies, whoever they were. They might have been communists. Years ago, they might have been communists at the present. They might have had only a guilt by association. No, no one ever knew. When you got that list, was there anyone you ever contacted to, make, to see if they were indeed unavailable? I didn't phone right away uh, to check it out because it was still churning in my mind. But I ran into a writer who, was, who was, was on one of those, the following writers are not available lists. 
And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that uh, you weren't available because I came across this short story that had been submitted by a literary agency. And I immediately thought of you because it's right up your alley to, to write a screenplay or write a, a teleplay for live television. And the guy said, what are you talking about? I haven't worked in months. And it hit me like a lightning bolt that this writer had no knowledge of the fact that there was a political move against him. So I didn't, I, I didn't explain this at all. I just said, oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong information or something. Do you remember who that was? Um, I'm sorry. I, at this particular moment, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, OK. Um, I remember exactly where this meeting took place. Sorry, it was a, it was a very uh, a known writer, a known writer, um, and I'm not withholding the name. I'm just just for, forgotten it. Uh, but I realized as I went went back to my office, I realized that this, you know something was up, and this thing that I knew about, I knew people were being blacklisted, I knew people were being denied employment, I knew that, but I had not come into contact with it like this at all. My union, which was then the Screenwriters Guild, now Writers Guild of America, my union participated in the blacklist by, in effect, supporting it, by um, demanding of, of writers that they express their, their political preference and so on. Who are they? And this was done out of the raging anger of unions going from the 30s into the 40s of liberal fighting conservative, radical fighting right winger, and so on. And all of the guilds went through that. How did the guilds participate in, in the black? Well, very specifically, um, there were uh, elections, of course, every year for the boards. And they were all writers or directors or actors. And in the Writers Guild, um, there was a very key election in late 47, 48, in which several people who were known to be communist were running for office, many who were not communist but were liberal, and there was a difference, uh, were running for office. The results were in, and the only people elected were the liberal people who were not communists. Those who were known to be communist or whose affiliation was known were defeated. So that was that really was a graphic demonstration. Do you think it was a fix, or do you think people uh, didn't vote for them because of the communist affiliation? Well, I think, I, from what I've been told from people who were there, they did not vote for them because of the communist affiliation, even though they were very prominent and probably very able, certainly in Guild Affairs. But I think that was hovering over it at the time. The Writers Guild did not was accused in Washington of being a stronghold of communists. And the Writers Guild at that time wanted to say, wait a minute, look, we just had this election. We are not a stronghold of communists. Mm -hmm. Prominent people who were communists, or were thought to be, were not elected. They were defeated. So the president of the guild at that time, a, a prominent writer named Emmett Lavery, um, went to Washington to appear, uh, to testify and to say, we had this election, what are you talking about labeling us as a communist organization? A lot of people didn't like Emmett Lavery doing that because that struggle continued of, I would say, radical or communist left, liberal, conservative, right wing, and so on. But that's how, um, and, and that happened in every union, every union participated in the blacklist in one way or another, that they, they, they condemned the members that they knew were communist or communist affiliated. When you were working at the networks, did you realize that some people were working under assumed names? Uh, some writers, yes. I, well, as, a, as, a, as an example, I'd, I'd, I'd heard about that. One day, a script got to my desk. I read it. I thought it was terrific. I did not recognize the name. I went down the corridor to the office of a producer whom I knew, Charles Russell, Charlie Russell, very able guy. And I went in and I said, Charlie, 
look at the, this is a terrific script. We should get this guy on some assignment here. Who is this? And I pointed to the name on the cover. He said, close the door. So I closed the door and he looked up at me and he said, that's Walter Bernstein. Walter was a very prominent screen and television writer who was blacklisted and we all knew it. And this was a, a pen name for Walter Bernstein. Charlie Russell knew that because Charlie had hired Walter on a CBS live show called You Are There, which was a terrific live show narrated by Walter Cronkite. And Walter had to work under an assumed name to work on that show. We were talking about the Hollywood blacklist and yes. how it uh, affected you personally. Um, it affected me a great deal, not politically, but it affected me in the sense that I, I became politically frightened. I think that's, that's the way to put it. I didn't sign any political petitions after, after all of this. I didn't, sign, I didn't go into any political meetings of any kind, even you know, simple Democratic Party meetings. I did not do anything of a, of a political nature because I was afraid, literally afraid, of what was going on. I felt that, that I, I had no uh, uh, political affiliation that could be even remotely connected with what was going on, but it didn't seem to matter to the people who were b doing the blacklisting. It was guilt by association, and I knew that. And it, it just, uh, it, it frightened me. I wanted to stay away from any of the politics of that time, which was exactly the wrong move. I mean, you know, you were supposed to try to fight this. Uh, but I, I was very, very troubled by it. And, and I, felt, um, I felt that we were going through a terrible, terrible thing in America and that the whole town seemed to me to be, to be frightened. 